Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Work Comp Talk. My name is Carmen and joining me in today's podcast is as always, Bilal Qasim. It's almost like a thing now, you know, he hasn't missed in a couple of episodes. I want to say a total season if we wanted to call it a season. And we're super excited to have you on board. President and co-founder of Pacific Workers, the Lawyers for Injured Workers, who also happen to be our sponsors for the podcast. If you're new to the podcast, make sure you hit subscribe on whatever pod platform you're listening to us on. That way you get notifications when we dump a new content or a new episode on there for you. We are on social media, YouTube, TikTok, and everywhere as well. You can either follow us through Pacific Workers or through the podcast itself, Work Com Talk Podcast, and we're super excited to have you here. Today's topic, Bilal, it's going to be a topic that a lot of people need to listen because this topic is either a make it or break it type of case for anyone going through a workers' comp case. So there is such a thing as a oops or a mistake within workers' comp, and that's what we're going to be diving into. What are the most common mistakes people do? What are the biggest mistakes you can do in workers' comp that can hurt your case? Sounds cool, Bilal. Are you in for this? I'm ready. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's going to be tons of other mistakes that can happen along the lines, but we're trying to narrow it down to your top five mistakes that could potentially um, close your case out for you and literally leave you hanging loose and in a bad situation within the workers' comp system. We've always mentioned it. California workers' comp system is a very difficult system to navigate. It's a broken system. It's not a one size, one size fits all. Um, and there's a lot of little things that you can do that could potentially uh, become a negative within your case. So we're going to try to dive into that. And who better than Bilal as one of the best top premier workers comp attorneys in Northern California to dive into that with us. So where do we start? <laughs> oh, man, all over the place. It's, uh, you know, I see mistakes left and right often. And unfortunately, for some clients, it's it's too late. You know, I think the biggest mistake I see just from the get-go is that clients, you know, they wait too long to ask for help. And I think you had just touched on this briefly in the fact that California workers comp is a really complex system. It's not there really to help the injured worker from my perspective. It's really this bureaucratic, hard to navigate cluster <laughs> that just makes it very difficult for people to get the care and financial support they need when they're recovering from injuries. And a lot of people they try to navigate the system on their own. And unfortunately, it goes on for six months, 12 months, two years. Uh, we had a lady come to us who had been navigating the system since 1998. And, Thanks. you know, when you're that far along, it's really hard for attorneys to kind of double back and fix mistakes and problems that come up in case. So, you know, just step one, I think the biggest mistake that I see people make is trying to handle things on their own. And quite frankly, most people don't have the experience or the knowledge to do that. And they dig themselves into a deep hole. Um, so it's and sometimes, deep. yeah, and sometimes we can help people, you know, we can bring the case back, we can find errors or issues that we can remedy pretty quickly. Other times, what's done is done. And you know, some clients will come to us and they're like, Hey, you know, I've got this hearing, it's set for next week. The judge said that, you know, my case is going to be closed out. If I don't make a decision, I need help. I'm like, okay, well, you know, here, this is it already. Like what's done is done. And, you know, even if we show up to the court, the judge isn't going to have much sympathy to the fact that the person just hired an attorney because it's already been so long in the first place. And so that's probably mistake number one, I think. Um, the second biggest mistake I think I see people do is not making their appointments, not showing up to things like uh, their primary treating physician appointments, to court dates, to depositions, to QME appointments. There's actually regulations that state if you don't show up to appointments, the insurance carrier can either suspend or bar your right to collect benefits, which means, you know, if you were getting temporary disability and you don't show up to appointments, they can file a petition with the court to ask the court to allow them permission to stop your monetary benefit, which obviously can have catastrophic effects for both the injured worker and their family or whoever else they're supporting. Um, and if they still don't make appointments, the court can actually instruct the, the insurance carrier with permission, uh, of course, uh, to terminate the right to collect benefits, actually bar them from collecting benefits at all for that period of time. So 
it can be fairly catastrophic for a case not making appointments. In addition, the insurance company won't take your case seriously if you're not seeking medical treatment. You know, if you don't care and you're not making your appointments, you're not following up medical treatment, the insurance company is going to look at you as if you're either making up for your injury or it's not as significant as you make it out to be. And so if you change your mind or you decide you want to seek treatment later on, that can significantly impact your case insofar as the insurance company's perception of you and your injury, which ultimately means Maybe you get a smaller settlement. Maybe you don't get the care you need. Or maybe the insurance company treats your case more like fraud because they say if you weren't that injured then and you weren't seeking treatment then, what are you doing now? Right. So let me ask you a question, right, quick, in regards to not showing up to appointments. You being the attorney you are and you've helped thousands of people throughout your entire career, I'm pretty sure you've seen this happen more than once. What is the reason why people don't show up to appointments that you've heard of? You know, it can be a variety of reasons, and some of it's not not entirely under the injured worker's control, and I really feel for those people. Um, you know, one of them is the finances. Um, you know, if someone lives in a more remote area, I guess, and they need to drive 45 minutes to go see a specialist, and they can't necessarily drive that far. I mean, look at gas prices right now, right? I, <laughs> I think I saw over seven dollars the other day. Oh and my goodness! I'm in, I'm employed in a full time role, and even I'm like, ah, oh, you know that that really stings. And I maybe I should think about how much I drive and such. And so, if you're an injured worker and you're barely scraping by on temporary disability or state disability or whatever it is, like maybe you don't have the financial means to make appointments. And so, what right. happens then? You know, in my firm, we're, we're really cool. We have a corporate Uber account and. We'll actually shuttle people around in, you know, lifts or Ubers or whatever to make sure that they get to appointments when they're in need and stuff. So it's something that I'm very happy that we can do for people um, just to ensure that people are getting the care they need. But someone who's not supported by an attorney's office like us or maybe another attorney's office that doesn't go to the same level of care that we do may put that person in a, a weird predicament. And that can have the same ripple effect. If you don't go to the PTP appointment and you don't have an up-to-date work status, at the end of the day, no one cares that you don't right. have the financial means to go to the appointment. The insurance company is like, oh, this person's not going to the appointment. We're going to cut benefits as soon as possible. They don't have sympathy for people like that. They don't. Um, and they probably even can think this person's not really in pain because obviously if they're not even showing up mm -hmm. to their doctor's appointments, that just explains that it's not even that serious, that the person can live without the uh, medical treatment that is being provided. So it's almost a scary situation to be in. And I'm glad that, you know, Pacific Workers has that corporate Uber account because it's not every day that an attorney can say, hey, don't worry, we'll take you and bring you back home. We'll figure out how you can get there. I definitely think that, you know, you touched on a very important part, which is monetary issues a lot of the people because yeah. they can't work because they haven't worked or let's just say they just can't drive themselves because mm -hmm. of the fact that they're injured or their injury doesn't allow them to do that but they don't count or have anyone they can count on then what, what do they yep. do you know it's it's kind of scary so no that's that, another big one yeah and not being able to navigate yourself because you're hurt like that lady yeah. that was with her injured or broken like she had her broken foot for God knows how many weeks and she was walking around with it because she wasn't getting taken yep. care of by the workers' comp insurance. That's psycho. Yeah. And look, I, I just had this, uh, maybe it was, oh God, you know, COVID's kind of screwed up my brain, but <laughs> I feel like it was just yesterday, but maybe it was still while everything was locked down. But I had a client who needed to drive from, uh, I believe it was Stockton down to Merced to have epidural injections in her spine. And she could drive physically. She's okay to do that even with her functional limitations. But the doctor's office said, well, if you come down here and you get an epidural injection, we can't let you drive home. Right. Because so, it's like you're not going to feel anything. So Exactly. So it put the client in a weird position because even though she was physically able to drive, she doesn't have support around her in her community to be able to get the ride there. And so, right. of course, you know, I woke up at, I think it was like 5 a.m. to call the Uber because it was like an hour plus drive or something like that. And I coordinated with her and the Uber driver and I made sure she got there. And then I called her Uber driver, you know, when they released her home and stuff. So we're able to help find out. But even the type of medical treatment and the fact that people don't have the community that support around them yeah. to be able to do things like get dropped off for surgery, get picked up from surgery, have um, a 
attendant at home to look out for them while you know they're drugged up and kind of loopy and stuff like that. Those are all other reasons too why people really can't make appointments because they say I don't have the support I need in my community, let alone the finances to do it, or maybe the the functional limitations are in the way from my the pain I'm having and stuff like that. There's a tremendous wide variety of reasons why people don't make appointments and some of it's not their fault. Correct. So we have not attending appointments, whether that's QME depositions, doctor's appointments, the importance of showing up period. Um, Mm -hmm. We also have, you know, what you mentioned, a lot of people, unfortunately, not being able to get to their doctor's appointments. What happens, and this is just me theoretically speaking or thinking, what happens if something happens along the lines and you have a deposition to go to and you don't show up? One, because you had an accident on your way to the deposition, or two, you forgot about it, or three, your car broke down. What are the repercussions of not showing up to a deposition? So first off, literally everything you just said happens in real life. <laughs> People, yeah, I've, had car, uh, I've had clients get in car accidents on their way to depositions. Um, I've had clients who sleep in and forget about it. I've had clients who just don't want to go, right? And right. so all that stuff happens. And you know, the question is how that impacts their case or what happens. And generally, everyone kind of gets a freebie, right? I think we all make mistakes, right? We all sleep in once in a while. We are alar- Our phone dies, so alarm doesn't go off, you know? Or, you know, we do get in a car accident and the car accident's not our fault and such. And those are all legitimate reasons why that happens. Right. And generally, no one cares, right? When that, if it's a first time, oh, you missed the deposition, you've gone to every other appointment, you've been pursuing your case. Okay, fine. The defense and the insurance company aren't happy about it. Mm. but you kind of get a free pass, right? It's like, okay, okay it it's happens, the world, whatever. My anxiety just went like... Yeah, <laughs> but like if it's habitual, right? If you've missed, you know, a QME appointment and your deposition was scheduled and you missed that too, the insurance company doesn't like that. Um, and if you miss an appointment, like a deposition, for example, the insurance carrier can actually file motion with the court and ask that the judge order you to appear for your deposition. Um, at which point, if you don't have a legitimate reason why you didn't appear in the first place, the judge will likely sign off on that. So the defense will always, not always, but a lot of the times it depends on how passionate the defense attorney is and fighting for their client and the insurance side. If you miss one deposition, they'll file a motion to compel. But oftentimes if there was a legitimate reason, like a car accident and we object to the motion, then the judge will take our side and not sign the order. Um, hint, hint. That's if you have an attorney and the attorney is going to help you out during the situation, which I think it's your best interest if, you know, that does happen to you to have an attorney. Because what happens if you don't have an attorney? You don't have someone to back you up. You, you technically are dealing directly with the insurance and the claim adjuster. And that's not going to be a nice thing to do. One, two, we can't stress enough the importance of having an attorney. You know, we've always mentioned the fact that the consultations are free. Get to know the attorney and at least know that if the insurance company is going to be having someone back them up as an attorney, then you need to have someone on your side. It's it's going to be unfair, you know, when they're, they the insurance companies have been in business for so long, they know what they're doing. Do you as an injured worker know what you're doing? You know, I think that that's where the importance of seeking help early on, which is the first subject we touched on also comes into play like having the benefit yeah. of the attorney like i call my attorney hey i just got into an accident or hey guess what i sleeped in the attorney covers for you in some way shape or form it doesn't make it seem so hard yeah. if it's just yeah directly with them definitely and i mean just knowing that you can object to a motion to compel or the consequences of not showing up in the first place are things that your attorney would advise you about in the first place and it gets more significant you know again if if you're ordered to show up at a deposition by the court and you don't show up the insurance carrier can do the same thing and petition to suspend your benefits. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, you're putting your health care and your, your finances on the line, basically, if you don't appear. So I think a lot of people, for whatever reason, people don't take the workers' comp process as seriously as if they were going through a case in the superior court for a jury and things like that. But it's just as serious. You know, there's real judges and it's real business and 
I think because the potential idea of a workers' comp case is, well, I'm not going to jail for it unless I'm doing fraud. And I'm not doing fraud, exactly. so it's not that big of a deal. But it is because ultimately it's your benefits. You're, it's almost like you're putting money on the line and you're just like, oh, they're not money's not important. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. It's like, no, dude, like this is your future. This is what's going to cover you while you're healing, et cetera. So I yeah. can see, I can see why someone would not take it as serious you know like oh nothing will happen it's kind of like going to, to court for for a speeding ticket like if that <laughs> was, like, yeah, exactly like, exactly and even then it's getting a little hectic with those too okay so we've covered one the importance of you know getting in help early on in your case and not waiting until the last minute Two, the importance of showing up to all types of appointments whether that's a trial a depot a a doctor's appointment etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. What would be our third one? Um, the third one would really probably be getting bad doctors on your case. The uh, treating physician or uh, QME, they really can make or break your case for you. Um, and unfortunately, there are doctors that pick sides, right? There's, there's facilities that are notoriously insurance oriented. And there's other facilities and medical professionals that are notoriously applicant injured worker oriented and i think understanding who those people are and where they fit in the game is incredibly important to the success of your case and i can't tell you how many times i've i mean look i've helped thousands of people seven thousand or something like that at our firm now and we see a lot of the same types of injuries you know herniated discs and such and there's so many different cases where just because they had a different doctor, the outcome was completely different, right? It's the same exact type of injury, same situation, but, you know, Dr. A versus Dr. B. Dr. A made this person's life a living hell. Dr. B gave this person everything they wanted and more. Um, and so I think understanding who the doctors are is incredibly important and picking the right doctors because you have a treating physician in the worker's comp case, which is generally the person who sees you and gives you medical treatment and uh, controls your work status and things like that. In workers' comp, you can also go to what's called a qualified medical evaluator known as QME, and that doctor is used when there's um, one side or the other wanting to contest either a liability issue or the opinion of a treating physician. Right. And so if you have a crappy treating physician, you end up with a crappy QME, that's it for you. You know, you're not going to do any better. And so at least controlling to some extent who you go to is a QME even if you don't have great choices for your treating physician is incredibly important to the success of the case. Yeah, that's super important. And I'm glad you touched on this subject. You know, everything evolves in a some way, shape or form and unfortunate for some to mistakes that can easily happen to anyone. It could happen. You might not think I started to have, like, look at what they're talking about. That's not going to happen to me. It happens. And that's out of your control more so specifically the fact that, you technically don't really know who your doctor is going to be if you don't have representation. And we've talked a lot about this in prior episodes and blogs that you can also find everywhere on YouTube. The importance of having someone on your team, on your side, fight with you, along with you, that has kind of learned the ropes of the course more so than than not you know it's like attorneys have worked with most of the doctors that are in the bay area more than once so there is a, a black list that exists internally with each attorney's head and like mm, i remember that doctor like if that doctor comes to one of my clients i'm for sure gonna ask my client let's change because it's not gonna be a great outcome and that's another that's positive fun. reason right to have to having that attorney help out and and whatnot i think one of the and i think we've talked about this as well the concept of an injured worker to not seeking legal help or not seeking the help of an attorney because one, they think that the attorney's gonna keep all of the money or two, because they think that the system is easy. It's just another error, right? Believing that the insurance company is gonna have your best interest and they're gonna take care of you as well as the doctors and stuff like that. Like, I can- Definitely. Definitely. And you know, you're right. So for example, I can think of one doctor off the top of my head. I'm not going to name names, but I know my That's office burning, personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, and this, this doctor is a good doctor, right? So I don't want to burn them as a, as a, <laughs> a good doctor, you know, but they've, they've been on over 300 plus cases with my office. I know for a fact is, is a qualified medical evaluator. And there have been on 300 cases in my office because we know not to strike that doctor because we generally think they're a fair and respectable doctor that's going to do a good job 
for the client and just the case in general. And so, you know, I know that doctor. And if I see them on a state issued panel, I know they're good. And if I was an injured worker, I would pick them. But right. if it's my first work injury, I don't know that. Maybe I pick the doctor that's terrible. And there's doctors that we avoid like the plague, you know, because we know that they're not going to give the client a fair shot. So I think that, I guess, institutional knowledge is incredibly important. Awesome. But kind of like what you said, you know, I think one of the other biggest issues that we see in workers' comp is thinking that the attorney really won't provide that much value because they think that the employer and the insurance company is really there for them. And I always, I've made this joke like 10 times on our show here that like, you know, the Geico commercials are all state or whatever, where the person's house is on fire and the agents brought them like hot chocolate and a blanket. And they're hugging them out in front of the house. It's like 2 a.m. being like, it's okay. Like patting them on the back and stuff. Like it's not what insurance is at all. And I think the insurance company's number one game is to take in more in premiums and they pay out in claims so that they can be profitable. That's, that's their game. And Unfortunately, it means taking advantage of people sometimes and not giving them the care or the benefits they are entitled to or deserve. In some cases, it's taking advantage of the situation, whatever situation it is that then affects the people more so. Um, and it sucks. I'm glad we're touching this point because I think that that's, I would, if I was an injured worker and I'd have to go through a list of mistakes that I'm going to do, that probably be my first mistake. Thinking that obviously I just got injured, my boss is like, you know, hey, don't worry about it. Just go here. I'm going to trust my boss. This is someone who I work with. And l I'm assuming the claim adjuster calls you right away. And then you start dealing with some random person you just met. So technically, that's your go to person because you don't know who else to go to. So you're going to start establishing this idea of my employer's got my back. And so does the insurance company. I'm good. I'm set up until when shit happens. <laughs> like, yeah, I yeah, the biggest one we see is, you know, employers using their interpersonal relationships with their employees to put a wedge in their case being like, oh, you know, you don't want to go report this is workers comp because, you know, we've been working together for 10 years, and it's going to get me in trouble, it's going to cost the company money. So why don't you go to your own insurance? You know, why don't you say it happened at home, we'll take care of you, we'll pay you back, we'll pay you the lost wages. And then two weeks later, they're like, no, nah, you're fired. We're not paying you crap. And it's done. And now this person's stuck with medical reports to say their injury happened at home, which really screws up their case. And they're not getting any benefits or care, right? So we see that a lot. But a lot of people tend to just think, okay, insurance is there for my benefit. It's there for my support. And well, technically, legally, insurance is there for your support. In practice, it's there to limit costs as much as possible and reduce exposure. Um, and then on the employer's side, employers, workers' comp insurance is like car accident insurance, you know, on auto insurance. The more accidents you get in that are your fault, at least, the more your premium goes up. And so for employers, it's the same way. The more claims that are filed, the more the insurance company has to pay out the higher the employer's what's called experience modification increases, which means their insurance premiums go up. And so you have these situations where employers don't want injuries to happen or people paid out because they don't want their costs to go up. There's employees that I've heard, and I'll tell you because my dad went through the same whole couple years back, you know, when he got injured at work. And the first thing that I remember his manager saying was, dude, you don't want to go through the workers' comp system. Their doctors suck. You should just pretend like this happened at home and go to your normal doctor, which are going to take you, take care of you way better than any other workers' comp insurance company or yep. doctor's office will. That's like a, I guess, a more believable excuse to listen to your employer. But at the same time, the moment you say one little tiny bit like, oh, yeah, no, it actually happened at work, you're screwed both ways. Because now not only will the insurance company not help you or the insurance doctor not help you, your doctor's not going to help you. He's like, who's going to pay me? You know, it's, ugh, it's a bad situation. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many cases we've seen where someone said, you know, I worked there for 25 years. I thought we were family. I thought they would take care of me. I thought they cared about me. And, you know, the second I was injured, you know, I was kicked to the curb. How many cases have you gotten where they're actually family, brother-in-laws, brothers, uncles? Dad? You know, it's hard to say, but, you know, we get the scope of cases, right? Like we have a ton of cases against Tessa. We have 
you know, tons of Amazon cases. We have a lot of corporate cases for airlines and manufacturing facilities, even like Google. We have all these big companies we deal with, but we also have a lot of cases with small kind of, we call them mom and pop shops, you know, like Bob's Burgers or something like that, where it's family owned or it's a small like company that's five to 10 people, something like that. Right. And I think that's where things tend to get more nasty because, you know, the finances aren't there, right? It's a smaller business. So cash is tight. Um, things like higher insurance premiums affect the bottom line more significantly. And also there's a more tense interpersonal conflict between people you know maybe two people didn't like each other anyways and then one of the people got hurt and now it's even worse because their relationship's even more strained because they feel like it's a personal attack trying to seek medical care for their injury and stuff so it's like i think you see in those smaller cases which there are quite a, a, a big number of those where there's a lot of resentment against the injured worker just by virtue of the fact that they filed the case which it's illegal to discriminate against someone because they filed a workers' comp case, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So, you know, we do see that quite a bit, I think. Talk about drama everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, yep. cool. we've covered, I want to say, not believing or not trusting that the insurance company and your employer is your best friend, not showing up to appointments, the importance of, you know, seeking for legal help early on. and getting a bad doctor what would be the fifth and last biggest mistakes that you see mostly injured workers um doing within a workers comp case you know it's incredibly hard for me to to kind of limit these to the biggest in some sense i mean i think these are the biggest ones in some generalized sense i think the largest mistake that i see is not educating yourself in a way that you can be your own advocate in some sense. Um, and even with an attorney, you know, like you, yeah. I think a lot of people tend to just take a back seat and let the comp case kind of drive itself, but really being proactive, you know, and really making sure that people are held accountable, that the doctors are doing their job, that the insurance company's doing their job, that even your own lawyer's doing their job, you know, and okay. being involved in the case is incredibly important. You know, I tend to think that people don't want to be involved that much. People don't want to know the, the grimy details, but I think it's important. You know, if you're an injured worker and like you're curious what temporary disability means, you should Google it. <laughs> you know, if you're if you're curious about what happens at hearings and you don't have an injured or uh, excuse me, an attorney, Google it. Like do your research. Try and figure out the most you can about what's going on in your case so that you can be an advocate for yourself. And don't let people bully you around or tell you, you know, no, when you're in the right. And I think a lot of people are intimidated dealing with the insurance gestures. They're intimidated by the doctors. They don't know how to navigate the system and they're not doing their own due diligence to figure it out in some sense. So I think people let the comp case drive itself and it puts them in a bad predicament because it takes them down a ditch. <laughs> yeah. And once you're down, you're down, like it's incredibly hard to dig out again. And so I think there's people not really taking it seriously and understanding the gravity of what's happening and doing their own research. I mean, when you bought a car, how many times do you like Google it? How many times do you like look at pictures of it? You researched it, you look at safety ratings, you do this, you do that. Like, even when we want to eat at like a fast food restaurant, we like scour the Yelp reviews, like oh. reading every single line and looking at all the pictures and stuff. But then it comes time you're injured, your life's on the line and you like can't be bothered to Google anything, you know, like, so I think people not taking it seriously enough, not really researching, not being proactive just generally in their case can, can be very difficult for them. Yeah. What, because of the fact that you just mentioned being prepared and you touched on a little subject that I kind of want to like really emphasize there's attorneys and there's attorneys so I think that's also very important if there's mm -hmm. something fishy going on with your attorney because there is attorneys that just because they're attorneys for workers comp doesn't mean they're going to be on your side it's very important to prepare yourself and dig into the information of what attorney you're actually going to hire because again there's attorneys yeah there's attorneys right below <laughs> there is and there's a fine balance right um and there's a i guess you would call it like a an armchair lawyer right it's or a keyboard warrior or whatever you know with these it, 
it's difficult sometimes because I've had clients who I truly thought that I was helping and had their best interest at heart, which is what my legal and ethical obligations are as an attorney. I do my best to get them the best results possible and their interests come first, no matter what. But I felt like my clients sometimes would challenge what I have to say. And that's cool. You know, I, I appreciate them questioning me. I appreciate them wanting to know more. Sometimes people can go too far, though. And I think what people don't understand is that, you know, it's teamwork. The attorney and the client do have to work together. It can't just be the attorney battling the insurance company and battling the client. And oftentimes the best results achieved when the attorney and the client are working together proactively to understand, to make sure that everyone's on the same page, that everyone understands what's happening. It's teamwork. You know, sometimes the client is at arms, you know, against the attorney. And it makes representation very difficult because if you don't trust your attorney, the attorney can't get the work done for you. You know, they, they can't truly advocate for you if, if you don't believe in them. And same thing, the attorney has to believe in the client too. But right. that's all part of being prepared. That's all part of making sure the attorney and the client are always on the same page, that they discuss medical appointments. They talk about treatment regularly. They talk about upcoming hearings. They prepare for depositions together. I think having that open line of communication ensures that there is a level of trust that there is a level of certainty and security for both the attorney and the client so that they can work together to ensure that the client's going to have the best shot possible of getting the results they need right but even then you know i think a lot of times people get afraid to call their attorney and talk to them ah oh, you know i know they're busy i don't want to i don't want to take up too much of their time which a lot of clients say to me I give them my cell phone. I tell them to call me whenever. You know, it's no big deal. But even then, they still feel like they're taking up my time, which isn't true. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, I want to talk to them. I want to make sure they're comfortable. Not all attorneys do that, but I think bothering your attorney to the extent that you feel informed is absolutely essential. You know, I think you need to educate yourself. You need to be prepared, especially for things like depositions, trials, QME appointments, and stuff like that. You can't just show up unprepared and you know wing it as it were <laughs> i mean just wing it and see what happens <laughs> yeah no it's not it's not going to help you um so yeah i think preparedness understanding researching being an advocate your first serious that all kinds of falls under the umbrella of you know preparedness or being proactive and yeah. and being a part of your case and working with your attorney or if you don't have one you know whether that's information and assistance at the worst comp appeals board or if you're feeling brave and you want to do it on your own, you know, just not not half-assing it, you know, being committed, being all in to, to fight for yourself. Technically. Well, I do want to thank you for your time, Bill. I want to take, thank you for taking the time to digest all of these biggest mistakes that could potentially come up and do potentially come up within the workers' comp system. Um, as you guys know, we are also a work comp law firm here in Northern California. And since we are sponsored by Pacific Workers, then what best than to close out this podcast with a brief introduction as to who Pacific Workers is. We will catch you on the next episode. On the meantime, check out our sponsors.